Hello YouTube world, this is Logic Crazy and I'm Jonathan and here's another tutorial on creating a Java chess engine. Uh, in this tutorial we're going to focus on bitwise operations just to help reinforce the idea of how uh, bit boards work and how we can manipulate them to get the uh, information that we are looking for. So I've written this program called console, you'll find it in the uh, description below the video on YouTube. Uh, feel free to download uh, this code. It's uh, about 30 lines of code here and what it does is it allows us to try different bitboard manipulations and actually see what happens. So for instance, uh, I've just run this and asked you to enter bitwise operations. So if I entered 1, it would show me the binary representation of 1 with a 1 on the rightmost side. If I were into a, a number 2, it put uh, one on the second most and a three uh, would put two ones here on the right. So you can get an idea of what, uh, uh, how it works. And if we did uh, some math, it also uh, works. So if we did one plus one, we get the equivalent of the two in binary. So you can do different math. You can use brackets and different things like that. Um, so let's get started here. So one would be a one on the right hand side, as I said and a 4 would be uh, the third rightmost bit would be a 1. Now if I do 4 plus 1, you will notice that a 1 goes in the rightmost bit, like the 1 did, and a 1 goes in the third. So it's borrowing the 1s from the 1 and the 4. However, let's take different examples, 1 and 3. Here, for instance, they share a common bit. And so what happens is the bits get carried over to uh, um, to a higher uh, a placement uh, to the left. So when you do 3 plus 1, you'll notice it turns into the equivalent of a 4, but it carried the ones to, uh, to the, towards the left. Kind of like when you uh, add um, and you add 9 plus 9, things carry over to the tens column and so on uh, for just basic math. And the same is true in binary. All right, but let's get a little more complicated. Uh, say 31. So here we have five ones on the rightmost side. I believe that's five, yeah. Uh, if we did negative 31, here's a way to test how, to actually see how these negatives affect the uh, binary representation. So what happens is two's complements. So we invert all of them. So all the places where there used to be zeros are now ones and vice versa. And then we add one, which just placed, since this rightmost digit was a zero, would have been a zero, we turn it into a 1. So you just invert and add 1. Just in case you thought that was complicated, it isn't. It's that simple. So 1, then if we did a negative 1, you will notice that they all turn into 1s. And one of the nice things about uh, the two's complements is, as I have said, 0 and negative 0 result in the same thing. Um, because of this adding of a 1. So I won't go into details about that, but that's one of the bonuses to this. Um, let's try something else. Let's do 15 here. You'll notice four 1s on the right-hand side. And then there's a squiggly mark with a 15. The squiggly mark is usually found on the top left-hand side of your keyboard, up where the 1 digit is, um, above the Q on your keyboard. You should find that there. It looks like a squiggly thing. And what it does is it inverts or negates it. So when I do squiggly 15, you'll notice it's like the first step of two's complement. It takes all the ones and turns them to zeros and vice versa. But it doesn't add that one. See, in negative 15, the only difference would be there would be a one on the right-hand side, like so. So two's complement really does the negation, the squiggly 15 thing, and then it uh, adds one to the result. Um, so that's one way of manipulating uh, uh, bits and bit boards. Uh, this, these digits obviously could be a bit board is how you could see them. Just a series of ones and zeros is what a bit board is. However, this is 32 bits, um, just because I didn't want it to be too long, and uh, a bit board we're making is 64, since that's how many squares there are on a on a chessboard. All right, let's take another example here. Whoops, 
Uh, let's try 57. All right, so here we have a several ones on the right-hand side with zeros in between. Now, there's another thing we can do, and that is using uh, your square brackets. You put two square brackets and then, let's say, a one, and what that does is it shifts the entire set over one. So if I hit Enter, you'll notice all of these three ones have been shifted over one, and this one that was on the very rightmost has been knocked over the edge of the cliff, so to speak, and is kind of lost in limbo. So we've just shifted everything over. Um, you can also do it the other way. So we could take this 57 and shift it over 4 the other way. And now you'll notice from the original here, all bits have been shifted over 4, making four zeros on the rightmost side that are kind of filling in the unknown there. So you can see how we can just shift the bit board from side to side, which is advantageous, and I'll show you how in just a minute. But let's take one more example before I show you why shifting is so nice. Uh, negative 57 here. All right, so it's really the inverse plus 1. And that is what it looks like, a whole whack of 1s and 3 zeros. Now if I did negative 57, I can shift over to the right 1, and we all understand how that works. Now, notice that a 1 was filled in on the leftmost column, because when everything shifts over, it has to choose what that leftmost item is. Um, is it going to be a 1 or a 0? Because it wasn't known before. It doesn't just wrap around. It doesn't just take the rightmost one and shift it over to the left. It just uh, fills in one. Here's another way you could do this. 57 and do three of these square brackets and then one. And what happens is when you do three of these square brackets, it says make the leftmost digit a 0, no matter what. If you only use two, then it says whatever the leftmost digit used to be, make it the same. So it used to be a 1, keep it as a 1. Over here, when we shifted to the right 1 with positive 57, it was a 0, so it became a 0. So in positive numbers, uh, shifting over 2 or 3 square brackets uh, doesn't make a difference as long as the leftmost bit is a 0. But if it's a 1, there is a discrepancy between the two, uh, just so that we are uh, following on that. Uh, let's take another example here um, before I get into the shifting phases. So let's take 17. Whoops. I think I typed in something wrong here. I'm going to rerun this. All right. 17 looks like so. If we do 15, it looks like that. Now, uh, here are some different uh, options we have. We can do 17 and... 15. Now what happens is it says it takes all of the bits that are, pot that are ones that are in common with both of these 15 and 17, and only the rightmost bit is in common. Both of them are a 1. So the result of 15 and 17 is 1. Now you can do another thing. Of course there's an OR, and this is a straight up and down line. It's usually found near the enter button on your keyboard, near where you put the quote symbols, like so, or your curly brackets, which we've been using in programming. So if we did 17 or 15, notice what happens. Any place that there's a 1 in either of these, it gets carried down into the result of 17 or 15. Now, another option is 17, and then what we usually use to define power of, but here it is not the power of, it's the XOR statement. So or XOR 15. And what that means is basically, notice how the um, everything got carried down except what was common between both of them. So all the ones that were either in one 17 or 15 got carried down, but all the ones that were in 17 and 15 did not get carried down. Thus, there's a zero on the rightmost side. So those are all the basic operators. Now let me show you again when we talked about these shifting. Remember, let's say we had 100, which looks like so, and if we do 100 shift over by 2, it would lose these zeros on the right-hand side. Um, 
But if we did, and I'll just add brackets, although unnecessarily, uh, to clarify this, we shift it over to, and then we say and one. Now what's going to happen? It's going to take all of this and say, um, and knock it off so that only the rightmost bit stands if it is a one. And the rightmost bit happened to be a one in 100 shift over two, so the result is a one. Now, here's what we have basically done. We've taken this 100, this is some random bit board, let's say, and we have said, is the second, or is this bit a one when we shift over two? So is the third bit from the right a one. If we tested this with, is the uh, is the second bit a one? You would find out that the answer is zero. So this and one will either produce a one or a zero. And this is how we test if a certain bit actually is a one or a zero in a bit board. So we have our bit board, which is represented as a hundred numerically, and what we want to say is, is this bit a 1 or a 0? What we're going to do is shift it over to the right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We'll shift it over 6 steps and then say, is it a 1 by saying this and 1? And the answer is true. However, is shifting it over 7, this bit right here a 1? And if we do that, we get the answer of no. So this is how we can test, is a certain bit in here a 1 or a 0? And that is basically the conclusion of this. Feel free to use this. You can use uh, all sorts of uh, different uh, mathematical operators and stuff and see the answer in binary twos complements. So I hope that you use this to experiment. If you're unclear on anything, actually use this program and test out whatever you want to figure out and it should help you feel confident about how to manipulate uh, bit boards, uh, at least the basics of them. All right, until next Welcome time, to enjoy Java. Welcome to as I show you two of my favorite sites for chess uh, and programming as well. Uh, so the first one is what I uh, like is this opening. Uh, it's found here at this uh, complicated site, um, this one here edudesign.com slash chessops dot uh, or slash uh, ch dash clear dot html or dot htm and what I like about this place is it lets you explore openings so for instance if I actually click on a piece and I say I want to move it too forward it'll move it too forward it'll tell me what is good and bad about this opening then if I did a counter move uh, let's say to d6 and uh, I try that out, it gives me a solution um, and continues talking about it. If I ever play a bad move like that, it tells me to try better next time. So it tells me that I was just really foolish. Uh, same with moving the king or something like that. So that's a great site to, to play around with and there's so many more things you can do. If you just go to chess ops, uh, then you have all sorts of different things you can try out. Um, so for early mating and then you can go there and learn about fool's mate or, or whatever you'd like. And another site that I really like is at gamedev.net. You should be able to just search for artificial intelligence and this site will open up. These links will be in the description below. Uh, but what I really like about this is these chess programming parts, part one, two, three, four, five, and six. Uh, they give you a really detailed, for instance, in getting started, really detailed and thought out uh, um, idea of how to produce a chess engine. Not using technical terms or programming concepts, but just talking about, uh, you know, how are we going to represent the board? How are we going to come up with move generation, search techniques, evaluation? Like these are basic things and just a bit of a discussion on each of them conceptually. And so I've really found uh, these to be helpful. So I hope that you uh, can learn something from these sites as I have.